that's what I love about the graphic novel and comic process is the collaborative nature and how once you move the story to the next person in the creation chain, you get to be surprised because everyone interprets it in their own way. And in that way, everyone gets to put their own imprint on it and have their voice heard as much as anyone else. Do you like books? I'm outlining a new writing project. Who wrote this book? Read it. Read it. Sometimes I'd write something. What are you writing? Have you written anything lately? I'm Amanda Stern, and this is Bookable. On today's show, searching for light in a dark world. Things are not always easy. Have you ever felt like you're in a tunnel trying to dig your way out and you're just getting nowhere? Like there's not even a light at the end. Well, our guests today. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Roxanne. This is Tracy. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know any Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Guests, as in plural. Well, these amazing writers and best friends co-wrote a fantastical story about trying to bring back light from a darkened sun. Time for an introduction. My name is Tracy Lynn Oliver, and the book is The Sacrifice of Darkness. My name is Roxanne Gay, and I am the co-author of The Sacrifice of Darkness. Roxanne Gay and Tracy Lynn Oliver. So, who wants to set the general story up for the listeners? I'm saying Roxanne does. <laughs> I bet you think that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're the original author, so. I am. The Sacrifice of Darkness is a, a story that began as a short story that is collected in my book, Difficult Women. It's a story, magical realism, set in a town where mining is the primary industry. And there's a man, Hiram Hightower, uh, who starts out loving his job. He's um, his father and his grandfather and his grandfather's father were all miners. And the mine owner, the mine owners decide to become greedy as wealthy people are wont to do. And they start demanding that the miners work more and more and he starts spending more time underground than above. And he becomes so consumed with darkness and craving light that he buys an air machine, flies it into the sun and the world becomes shrouded in darkness. And the graphic novel explores what drove him to do this and the aftermath because in the aftermath, his son Joshua and his wife Mara are left to face a series of councils who demand a sacrifice of some kind in the hopes that it will bring back the sun. Holy cow, that was amazing. From the Sacrifice of Darkness, page 12. A man with resolute strength, it took five years for the mines to finally break Hiram down. Five years of darkness instead of family. Five years of knowing more cold than warmth. Five years of living more life underground than above. Five years to rip the miner's heart from his chest and send him away from everything he loved so that he could touch the sun. Well, if I was ever going to have a crush on an animated character, it would be Hiram Hightower. Um, he's just a large hunk of a handsome man just on the surface, but also below the surface. Just a man filled with passion and love um, for what he does and for who he loves. And um, so admir admirable um, to have those qualities in one package. I'm so happy that you said that because I felt so awkward having the crush that I actually had on him. Okay, good. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah. hmm, too bad he's not single. Um, so as Roxanne said, he loves mining. It's in his blood. He comes from a generation of miners, and he loves being in the darkness for a time. Yes. What was it about the darkness? What was it about mining that he loved? What he loved about mining was being underground and seeing a world within a world. When he was underground, 
he got to find all sorts of treasures. And his father, in fact, would bring him back these treasures. And he would also do the same for his son, Joshua, when Joshua was a young boy. And so he loved the potential and the power and knowing that he was one of the men responsible for bringing this incredibly valuable substance from the ground and into the world. Mm. And he, and so there was something about the unseen that he also, yes. yeah. Um, so despite his love of mining, his favorite part of every day is emerging into the sun. Like he quote says, a long lost son. And the son here is the father, which reminds me of Icarus, sort of, and flying too mm -hmm. close to the sun. Was mm -hmm. there any influence there? Or am I making a myth out of an allegory? Uh, you're making a myth out of an allegory, but <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong. I mean, it's not a reach at all. So it's not, um, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not like anyone would be like, oh my God, where on earth did you get that from? I totally can follow that bouncing ball and see where you got that idea from. Yeah. Um, but is, was there any sort of um, direct influence or did you just sort of follow your gut on this? There was no direct influence. It was just my imagination and of course, Tracy's. Awesome. Um, so tell us how Hiram meets Mara. Um, well, they meet each other, um, Mara and her girlfriends walking back one evening from a dance uh, where apparently Mara was quite the wallflower and her friends are teasing her because of that. Um, and they're walking down the road and coming from the other direction towards these ladies is a group of miners having just got off work. And among those miners is Hiram Hightower. And as they get close to these groups, approach one another, uh, one of Mara's girlfriends playfully pushes her towards these men, just saying, maybe you'll have more luck with one of these fellows. Ha ha. <laughs> and as she stumbles and flails towards them, she gets caught and swept up in the arms of Hiram Hightower. And they look at one another and it just happens. It's on like Donkey Kong. Yes. <laughs> so on. Well, we don't want to give too much away, but the mine owners want the miners to work themselves to death in many ways. They don't really care what happens to the miners. What they care about is that they want the mines running 24 hours a day. And they're willing to do that at any cost, at any human cost. And they are mining a mysterious substance called Flareon. And uh, Tracy, tell us about Flareon. <laughs> Well, it's a mysterious substance that obviously does amazing things because these wealthy mine owners want it at all costs. So um, we, the reader doesn't know exactly what it does, but just that it must do something amazing. Um, and then later in the book, you kind of get an idea of what things Flareon can do. Right. And we'll, we'll save that. Okay. Um, so, um, but these oppressive days that are basically they've gone from eight hour days to 16 hour days and mm -hmm. six days a week um it drives Hiram Hightower towards lightness and so what is it what does he do what does this drive him to do you know he loves mining but this is too much even for him and to not see the light of day or the light of his family for those many days months however many months the the mine owners had decreed um, he just falls into desperation of any sort of light and warmth. And what's the warmest light in the world? It's the sun. So he's, de he's decided I need to get as close to that sun as I possibly can. I need as much light and heat that, I, that is available. And he decides to buy an air machine and fly it directly to the sun. And does he want to touch the sun or swallow the sun or be like, what is, what does he, does he care? I think, yeah, I don't think it's entirely clear, but I think he just needs to get there Yeah. and whatever happens when he gets there. I mean, Roxanne, what do you think? He just wants to be filled with light. He's not thinking about 
anything. He's not doing any, he's not trying to hurt anyone. He's trying to save himself. And he's so desperate. He's so consumed by the darkness and, and the never ending labor of, of having to mine. And he doesn't get to see his family anymore that he thinks that if he flies into the sun, he'll be filled with light and he'll remember why he's living and who he's living for. Mm. But that doesn't happen for him, does it? Not, Not really. No, unfortunately, no. So he flies into the sun, and slowly the sun disappears, and the world becomes darkness. And um, then we move into 2020. And <laughs> <laughs> so in the after... We learn how people have been living in the darkness and how scientists are trying to turn things back to normal. So eerily prescient. Um, can you take us through life in the darkness? Um, gosh, you know, it's so eerily kind of hand in hand with this year. But, you know, children can't go out and play. Uh, how do you do? How do you raise crops and mm -hmm. livestock? Like what, what do jobs look like at this time? you know, the world becomes shrouded in darkness. And so you have to imagine what it would be like to live in a world without sun. And so you need light, uh, artificial light, both day and night. And so they start to um, build these lamps, these gas lamps to light the town. And uh, various councils are convened to try and figure out what happened to the sun and scientists and politicians and others come together. It, it really is. Uh, I was very prescient, if I do say so myself, <laughs> yeah. uh, in trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And so the world becomes completely changed and people are obsessed now with bringing the light back. It is, it is beyond pressure. And I think it really feels like some sort of psychic portal because you have something called the Corona Council. I do. I do. In fact, uh, the publisher asked if we would change it. And oh, no. I was like, nope, I sure won't. Because it's not our fault. Seriously, but it's so weird. So weird. From the Sacrifice of Darkness, page 56. Claire and Joshua avoided each other for the next two days. When one would make eye contact, the other would quickly look away. Each of them very much aware of the other pretending not to be aware. I've thought about it. I, I would like to visit your home. It took you three days to decide that. What if I don't want you to come over anymore? I suppose we could walk together after school. Doing their best to avoid the stairs, Claire and Joshua made their first of many walks home together. Um, well, Joshua is the son of Hiram and Mara, and Claire is um, a little girl that he befriends, or that befriends him, I should say, at school. Be because he is now shunned because his dad took away the son. Their friendship obviously starts off as children and grows until they're kind of young adults. And during that time, Claire and Joshua really become each other's um, support system. Um, kind of they are each other's island, um, a safe place to fall. Um, you know, Claire takes him home to her house, um, and eventually Joshua takes him home, her home to his. Um, and eventually, as they get a little bit older, um, romance starts to blossom. Um, and then um, the council decides to stir things up yes, again, they do. Roxanne. You know, they start to demand more and more from Mara and Joshua. And uh, at first, Mara is incredibly beaten down because she is so sad. She's grieving the loss of her husband. And a lot of people have lost sight of that, that she actually lost her partner and the love of her life. But something pushes her over the edge after the councils just want too much. And there's 
you know, the price to pay isn't hers and Joshua's to bear. Um, And so she finally sort of snaps out of her grief and she and Joshua start to become defiant in the face of the council's demands. And the council wants them to sacrifice their own, their blood. Yes. They literally think that a, a blood sacrifice, that if they sacrifice Joshua's life, all of a sudden everything will be fine. for a short break. When we come back, we get graphic about how it feels to go from solo authors to close collaborators on a graphic novel. Stick around. Welcome back to Bookable. I'm Amanda Stern, here with Roxanne Gay and Tracy Lynn Oliver, co-authors of The Sacrifice of Darkness. Roxanne is no stranger to working in comics and graphic novels. In 2016, Marvel Comics hired her to co-write a Black Panther series with ta Coates. The series was praised for prominently featuring LGBTQ characters in the fictional world of Wakanda. When Boom Studios approached her to create an original project, she began to consider her options. As I was thinking about what to do, I thought, I actually have a story that I think would lend itself very well to the graphic novel format, uh, because it felt so visual as I was writing it, and that was The Sacrifice of Darkness. And um, (laughs) I was thinking my workload is untenable right now. And so I don't know if I have the time to do this. And then I thought, well, actually I would love to co-write this with someone. And uh, Tracy and I have been best friends for more than a decade. She's my favorite writer. And I knew that this story would be in great hands if we work on it together. And and if I just trusted her imagination and I was absolutely right. And so how did you go about expanding from the short story. So the short story focuses a lot on the after. How did, um, and it's told from um, from Claire's POV, while the graphic novel opens up into an omniscient right, right. narration and layers in the before time. So I was wondering if you could talk about the process of expanding the story and how how that worked between the two of you. Yeah, well, I knew that um, the story needed to get bigger um, you know, well, we all decided it needed to get bigger before it got um, scripted into the graphic novel format. So in rereading the story, which happened to be one of my favorite mm-hmm. Roxanne Gay stories at the time, um, so I was excited. Um, I saw that it was all, it really Hiram and Mera are a blip in the beginning for the big event, and then the rest of the story centers on Joshua and Claire. Um, so I was like, I need to know about more about Hiram and Mara and how they came to be and what would drive a man to, you know, make such a desperate act. So I first just sat down and did a long form, you know, story uh, of the before basically. And um, of course ran it past Roxanne and made sure she was cool with it and whatever tweaks she had incorporate those, get it over to boom for their blessing. And once I had that, it was the scripting process. And Roxanne, did you struggle at any point to compromise on any story elements? No, not at all. Uh, we were very much in sync and I trusted her and I, I think she trusted me. And so when she introduced ideas that I had not considered or that I thought, hmm, that's interesting, uh, I just trusted her and, and her creative instincts were always right. It is really interesting reading the graphic novel. It's, it is so consistently, it's just one voice, even the, even the tone, the tonal quality, even the color quality, it all feels of, of one voice. And it's sort of remarkable that you did that. Yeah. I, I, Roxanne has a really romantic writing style and I really don't. (laughs) So what I really needed to um, 
be mindful of while I was writing was to continue that style. So it didn't sound disjointed once it got to the page um, into, into the final format. So it was kind of fun, kind of stepping softly into her shoes, in other words, and trying to keep that same tone that the short story had. Um, it was, yeah, because uh, she's just a, a pretty <laughs> romantic. Um, I just, I, the way she writes, it's just different from my own style. So it was kind of neat to just like, okay, I got to sound like, kind of like doing a, like, I have to sound like Elton mm. John when I sing this song, but you know, it's, interesting it's hard. Because I, I feel like if you guys didn't know each other, if you weren't friends, this would be a completely different uh, result. Yeah, I, I wonder that because it was so easy. Like we've been asked about working together and it's kind of like, you know, it was a no brainer. I mean, we're used to uh, critiquing each other's writing or helping each other out. So it was, I didn't feel scared. I didn't feel nervous. I, all, all the changes or suggestions she made um, were easily digested and, you know, it was all done with, you know, our normal fun banter, et cetera. <laughs> but there's also just so much love in it to me yes. at least. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was so palpable. And I, and I feel like a lot of that must have, you know, obviously from your talent, but also from the love that you guys have for each other as friends. I feel like it really made itself known on the page, which is amazing. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you focus on specific themes when you were expanding the story into a graphic novel? I don't know that we're the type of writers who think theme. I think we mm -hmm. think story first. And the themes emerge from the story. Uh, certainly, when I was conceiving of the story, the short story, and also the graphic novel, I was thinking very much about class and poverty and exploitation and also race. And mm -hmm. that's how it all came together. But I, I, we were both primarily focused on just telling a really good story. From the Sacrifice of Darkness, page 78. When I was little, we'd all sit on this bench, and my father would tell me I was born in this garden. How they planted me right alongside the peas and beans until I was ripe and ready. Pretty silly, huh? My father's up there somewhere. I know. He didn't mean to do a bad thing. He was a good man. I miss him. I know that, too. I know. I miss him for you. We finished our script and they actually let us choose which artists we wanted to work with. They solicited samples from some really talented artists. It was really difficult to narrow it down to one. And then Rebecca had the script and she would send us uh, rough sketches of a series of pages and we would give feedback and then she would finalize those sketches and we would do that back and forth until she had done all 120 pages. And then once that was all finalized, we got samples from colorists and we selected James Fenner and uh, you know, his, the color palette was unexpected. Certainly. Um, I think I had envisioned something different and then I saw what he did with this book and it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. It really is. And it and the story tells us I mean, the color tells its own story in a way that I found really beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not a huge reader of graphic novels. It's not a form that I'm that familiar with, but I could read it, you know, without the words as well, which I'm sure many people that's how they read mm -hmm. graphic novels, but I don't. So um, what was it that you had envisioned, Roxanne? I had envisioned um, a, a brighter color palette and then a, a darker color palette. So I envisioned the story being really bright in the happier parts of the story and really dark, like black and white in, mm -hmm. um, when the sun disappears. And so when James sent in, started sending in pages for us to look at and offer feedback on, I was really surprised. Um, but then I fell in love with it. The mood and the tone 
of the art to me also felt very like a memory. When you were working on this, did you have an idea for what time frame, like how was this some, a story that someone was telling that had happened years and years ago or like what time period did you envision this? I didn't really. Um, Mm -hmm. It's meant to be ambiguous. It seems like it's both in the past and the future. But it's also funny you say that because in the few uh, things we've done with Rebecca recently when she's talked about her work is that she wanted it to feel like a memory. And I'm still waiting to hear more her, you know, talk about that more. But I thought that was really interesting that she was like, it's like, she wanted to feel like a telling of a, a memory. And I just think it's funny you hit on that. Roxanne Gay and Tracy Lynn Oliver, co-authors of The Sacrifice of Darkness. It's published by Boom Studios and Arkea and is available now. Bookable is a production of Loud Tree Media. I'm your host, Amanda Stern. Five feet tall, but feel free to draw me as a giant. We're produced by me, Bo Friedlander, and Andrew Dunn, who also mixed and sound designed the show. Bo is Loud Tree's editor-in-chief. Find us on the web at bookablepod.com, and please subscribe and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. And if you want to learn more about our guests, find us on Instagram at BookablePod and follow me, your host, at A Little Stern. I gotta say, it was a real joy to have two authors on the show today. But just like in any collaboration, there were some unique challenges to work out before we really got going. You know, I don't... Um, Oh, go ahead. Well, (laughs) I don't know that we're the kind. I'm going to speak for both of us and say, excuse me, I have the hiccups. This is bookable.